dieses schwarzen Himmelsblut verbrochen, dass wir mit dem Leben bestraft werden. Wie zur Vergeltung einer ungeklärten Schandtat reißt man uns aus einem gestaltlosen, schmerzlosen, namenlosen Frieden und fährt uns in strampelnde, fressende Körper, die von ihrem Hunger und Durst, ihrem Hass, ihrer Angst oder der nackten Blödheit getrieben, am Ende doch auf irgendein Schlachtfeld des Lebens verstümmelt werden. Und selbst wenn es uns gelingt, alt und gebrechlich zu werden, gehen wir nach dem Ratschluss irgendeines gnadenlosen Schöpfers schließlich doch zugrunde. An unserer Lebensgier, an unserem Zerstörungswillen, oder zugrunde am bloßen Lauf der Zeit und unsere Reste, faulend oder zu grober Asche verbrannt, fallen zurück in die Gestaltlosigkeit, in die Ursuppe irgendeiner nebelhaften Erbschuld, aus der sich dann das sogenannte Dasein noch einmal und immer wieder erheben darf, um auf die immer gleiche Art zu enden. I'm utterly amazed, utterly enchanted. I have a precursor, and what a precursor. I hardly know Spinoza. The guy should have turned to him just now, was inspired by instinct. Not only is his old tendency like mine, namely to make all knowledge the most powerful effort, but in five main points of his doctrine, I recognize myself. This most unusual and loneliest thinker is closest to me precisely in these matters. He denies the freedom of the will, teleology, the moral world order, the unequistic, and even. Incidentally, I'm not at all as well as I had hoped. Already six severe attacks of two or three days each. The intensity of my emotions make me shudder and laugh. Several times already I have not been able to leave my room for the ridiculous reason that my eyes were sore. From what? Each time the day before I had been weeping too much on my wanderings. And these were no sentimental tears, but tears of joy. Alas, my friend, sometimes I've got an idea that after all I live a highly dangerous life, for I am one of those machines which might burst. With affectionate love, your friend. Dear enigmatic friend, now it has been six severe migrant attacks. I am much worried about you. However, I am also much astonished that in the midst of such a torture you shed floods of tears. Not tears of pain, but as you write me, Tears of joy. Dear friend, you write, it was an instinctive act which made you long for him right now in the midst of your physicality bursting in all directions. Long for Spinoza. Spinoza and you. What kind of noteworthy connection is being announced here? making thought the strongest affection, making philosophy the most powerful affection, learning how to read it, philosophy, as a kind of desire, as a process of an event, in which the course of which desire starts becoming aware of itself, becoming self-reflective, I of myself, you, of yourself, we, of ourselves, feeling, thinking. 
dear friend, perhaps I may recommend you to read a young thinker whose writings have become very important for me, Gilles Deleuze. Recently he has written a book about you, Nietzsche and philosophy. Also he is a Spinozist like us. He explicitly named you next to philosophy as such, Nietzsche and philosophy, because you, as he believes, have placed yourself next to it by your whole corpus, next to the classical tradition of philosophy as such. He, this Charles Deleuze, says that you have come from it and have been raised by it. However, at the same time, you have outgrown it. After all, he says, you have become its most radical foreign substance, its decline and its transition, and thus also its new beginning. You conceived your thoughts to be the prelude to a philosophy of future. Therefore, the learn think it's significant to read your work as the precursor of thought events still waiting for us to be discovered and called into being posthumously after, even in the aftermath of your life. Such a futuristic, or let's say even avant-garde-like mode of thinking, of doing philosophy, says Deleuze, has an essential relation to time. It is fundamentally untimely, that is to say, essentially against our times, a critique of the present world in favor of a world, a time to come. I think, my friend, this show Deleuze was probably the first one who really understood the importance of the concept of the untimeliness in your work. Philosophy has always been untimely in each of its epochs, precisely because philosophers are, like artists, inventors. They are inventors of new concepts which are neither eternal nor historical, but untimely. Therefore, philosophy and the arts appear necessarily as a kind of dark precursor, as a sudden breakout of well-established powers addressing their thoughts to untimely friends, able and willing to let the times arrive they are starting to invent in a promising manner. Is this not the very reason why you, my philosopher friend Friedrich, were forced to create a new conceptual persona, the conceptual persona of the artist philosopher, of somebody being pregnant with an untimely future? The Lord thinks that you had this new species of philosophers, of artist philosophers in mind when you, in Beyond Good and Evil, were alluding to a new category of philosophers whose taste and inclination are the reverse of their predecessors. Tell me, my friend, what surprising trinity am I constructing here at the moment? Spinoza, Deleuze and you, Friedrich. Spinoza, the artist philosopher, Nietzsche, the artist philosopher, Deleuze, the artist philosopher. Three desiring machines longing to produce an untimely future. Michel Foucault, part one. Discipline and punish. 
the control of activity. Es geht um eine Zwangsfindung der Körper an den herrschenden Produktionsapparat die instrumentelle Kodierung des Körpers ist das Ziel dieser Tortur. Die gemessene und bezahlte Zeit muss eine Zeit ohne Fehl und Marke sein, in welcher der Körper ganz seiner Pflicht Tätigkeit hingegeben ist. Wie lässt sich die Zeit der Individuen kapitalisieren? Wie lässt sich in jedem von ihnen, in ihren Körpern, ihren Kräften und Fähigkeiten, ihre Zeit auf nutzbringende und kontrollierbare Weise kombinieren? Wie lassen sich profitable Dauerhaftigkeiten organisieren? Durch ununterbrochene Kontrolle und Druck der herrschenden Produktionsverhältnisse, Effizienz, Effizienzsteigerung, Übertragung ökonomischer Organisationsprinzipien auf alle Lebensbereiche globale Herrschaft der Ökonomie. Durch diesen permanenten Zwang wird die Herstellung einer vollständig nutzbaren Zeit zu gewährleisten versucht. Michel Foucault, Part 2. Discipline and Punish. The Control of Activity. Es ist ausdrücklich verboten, sich während der Arbeit zu unterhalten, Geschichten oder Possen zu erzählen oder sonst wie irgendwelche Spiele zu treiben. Und selbst während der Essenspause sollen keine Unterhaltungen geführt werden, welche die Arbeiter von ihrer Arbeit abdecken. Im richtigen Einsatz des Körpers, der einen richtigen Einsatz der Zeit erlaubt, darf nichts müßig und nutzlos bleiben, nur ein disziplinierter, von der Macht geformter, ihr angepasster Körper kann ein leistungsstarker Träger sein dessen Kot den gesamten Körper von der Fußspitze bis zum Zeigefinger erfasst. Es geht schlichtweg darum, aus der Zeit immer noch mehr nutzbare Kräfte herauszuholen, um an den Punkt zu gelangen, wo die größte Schnelligkeit mit der höchsten Wirksamkeit eins ist, mit der Zeit durchdringen und durchsetzen, den Körper, alle minutiösen Kontrollen der Macht. Ein solcher Organismus wird zum Organ der herrschenden Macht. Er wird ihr Agent, sichtbarer Ort ihrer Repräsentation. Reproduktion, einer die Macht revolutionierenden Macht. Dadurch wird die von der Macht durchgesetzte Reglementierung der Tätigkeit, ihre Forderung nach Disziplin und Disziplinierung der Körper zugleich das innerste Konstruktionsgesetz ihrer materiellen Manifestation. University Law 2002 by the University of Vienna, Paragraph 14, Section 1. The University Law of 2002 compels the development of a quality assurance management. Furthermore, paragraph 14 refers to external and internal evaluation, apart from the efficiency and efficiency of performance, also the latter's quality is a fundamental idea of public management. Quality assurance systems emphasize in particular the steering and control of quality. There is an international trend towards the issue of if and how quality assurance systems might be implemented at universities and which elements of total quality management might be relevant. Total quality management. Total quality management. Total quality management. What happens once our desiring machines have started to revolt against being disciplined and controlled by the might of power? All might of power naturally wants us to become one of its agents. It wants us to become timely. The established powers are no friend of protesting untimely desires. Do you know what I told you last time about this new concept of the artist philosopher by Friedrich Nietzsche by reading his postcard. What differentiates the species of artist philosophers from the ancient one is the way in which this new species of philosopher values the desiring machines unconsciously 
at work in the human nature and the work of nature as such. Being the precursors of the philosophy of the future, says Nietzsche, art is philosopher to resist the conceptual persona of classical philosophers because they don't follow the aesthetic ideal of doing philosophy anymore. That is to say, the self-denying force at work in a life longing for another life, different from the corporeal, earthly one, the immanent one, one has been given by virtue of somebody's birth. On the contrary, artist philosophers have discovered the productive force more or less unconsciously at work in nature. This, Deleuze says, discovery of the unconscious, of an unconscious of thought, just as profound as the unknown of the body, is part of the new image of thought Nietzsche and Spinoza have started to invent with you. Ever since, philosophers are no longer concerned with analyzing the real of their consciousness only, as we are trained in German idealism, for example. But like artists, as well with the pre-reflexive life, of their desiring machines, channeling, often directing their thought processes in a significant way, even before and beyond the control of somebody's ego, will, and self-discipline. Becoming an artist philosopher, Nietzsche says, therefore means something like a quote Deleuze, voyage in immanence. Because to Deleuze, I quote again, Immanence is the unconscious itself and the conquest of the unconscious. Dear Frederick, in Beyond Good and Evil, you developed almost the same image of thought when writing, I quote you, having long kept a strict eye on the philosopher's finger, and having looked between their lines, I say to myself, the large part of conscious thinking has to be considered, considered an instinctual activity, even in the case of philosophical thinking. We need a new understanding here. End of quote. Why? Because consciousness is scarcely opposite to the instinct, but rather secretly guided and channeled into particular tracks by them. In your late notebooks, Friedrich, I found a marvelous expression for this when you said, quote, thoughts are symbols of a game and fight of affections. They are always connected to their hidden roots. In this sense, I would like to send you my affectionate love, your friend, Franz Overbeck. Michel Foucault. Überwachen und strafen. Disziplin, dinamierende Sanktion. Strafbar ist alles, was nicht konform ist unter das Strafsystem der Disziplin fällt die Abweichung von der Regel. Deshalb arbeitet im Herzen aller Disziplinarsysteme ein Strafmechanismus, der mit seinen eigenen Gesetzen, Delikten, Sanktionsformen und Gerichtsinstanzen so etwas wie ein Justizprivileg genießt. Mit einer solcher Art hierarchisierten und stetigen Überwachung zur Erhöhung der Produktivität wird die Disziplinargewalt ein integriertes System, das von innen her mit der Ökonomie und den Zwecken der jeweiligen Institution verbunden ist. Universitätsgesetz 2002, Paragraph 13, Römisch 3, Punkt 4. Wissensbilanz. Die Wissensbilanz habe nach bestimmten betriebswirtschaftlichen Kategorien eine Art Bestandsaufnahme von Wissen zu geben. Diese Form der Bilanz soll der Tatsache Rechnung tragen, dass für Universitäten Wissen ein zentraler Produktionsfaktor ist. Nicht definiert wird im Gesetz. Paragraph 13, Römisch 3, 
Punkt 6. Was unter intellektuellem Vermögen, Humanstruktur und Beziehungskapital sowie Leistungsprozessen mit ihren Output, Größen und Wirkungen zu verstehen ist. Es handelt sich um betriebswirtschaftliche Begriffe, die hier auf den universitären Bereich übertragen werden. Kafka, the trial. In the empty courtroom. I see the K or whoever nodded. Those books must be law books. And that's how this court does things. Not only to try people who are innocent, but even to try them without letting them know what's going on. Die hierarchisierte, stetige und funktionelle Überwachung beruht in ihrer schleichenden Ausweitung auf den neuen Machtmechanismen, die sie enthält. Sie entwickeln sich so zu einer autonomen und anonymen Gewalt. Denn die hierarchisierte Überwachung der Disziplin beruht zwar auf Individuen, doch wirkt sie wie ein Beziehungsnetz. Die Macht dieses Netzes ist keine Sache, die man innehat, kein Eigentum, das man überträgt, sondern eine Maschinerie, die funktioniert. Zwar gibt dir der pyramidenförmige Aufbau einen Chef, aber es ist der Apparat, der Macht produziert. Es ist der Apparat, der die Individuen in seinem stetigen Feld verteilt. Das erlaubt es der Disziplinarmacht, absolut indiskret zu sein. Sie liegt immer und überall auf der Lauer. Franz Kafka, der Prozess. Einzusehen, dass dieser große Gerichtsorganismus gewissermaßen ewig in Schwebe bleibt, dass man zwar, wenn man an seinem Platz selbstständig etwas ändert, sich den Boden unter den Füßen wegnimmt und abstürzen kann, während der große Organismus sich leicht an anderer Stelle Ersatz schafft, weil es ist doch in Verbindung und unverändert bleibt. Wenn er nicht, was wahrscheinlich ist, noch geschlossener, noch aufmerksamer, noch strenger, noch böse. Der, der perfekte Disziplinarapparat wäre ein vollkommenes Auge, dem nichts entginge und auf das alle Blicke gerichtet wären. Man müsste die Disziplin zu einer nationalen Sache machen. Ein solcher Staat wird eine dauerhafte und leicht zu führende Administration haben. Diese wird den großen Maschinen gleich sein, die die größten Wirkungen hervorbringen. The trial. Lawyer. Stop being so unyielding, Kay. Or whatever may be your name. There is nothing you can do to defend yourself from this court. You have to confess. There is no mistake there. Our authorities don't go looking out for guilt. It's the guilt. It draws them out, like it says in the law. So confess to them as soon as you get the chance. And what if I don't confess? Ask Kay or whoever. Dear Frederick, what an amazing discovery. The Le Spinoza book, Spinoza Practical Philosophy, starts in fact with your name. Nietzsche understood, he writes there, having lived it himself, what constitutes the mystery of a philosopher's life. The philosopher appropriates the ascetic virtues, humility, poverty, chastity, and makes them serve ends completely his own, extraordinary ends that are not very ascetic at all, in fact. 
Maybe we face now, probably for the first time, a cultural dispositive in which philosophers, at least in some parts on this globe, do not have to hide themselves anymore behind the mask of the ascetic brief to do philosophy and make a living. Shouldn't we call this an amazing privilege of our times? Deleuze thinks that Spinoza's life is a good example of what it means to live a life that is in the very best philosophical sense untimely. Because due to his dribble denunciation of the image of thought widely supported at his times, the oeuvre of his philosophy became a corpus delicti. Firstly, due to the discrimination of consciousness, secondly, due to the discrimination of values, and thirdly, due to the discrimination of sad passions. It was this triple denunciation which, for Deleuze, was the very reason why Spinoza's philosophy in general has been judged as a scandal and crime against the well-established values of his times as a criminal way of thinking, even. Without surprise, living his philosophy therefore started with an excommunication and an attempt on his life. Deleuze is convinced that the major resemblance of your Friedrich and his work precisely lies in this triple denunciation, the discrimination of consciousness, of values, of sad passions. I will tell you more about it later. Ida is waiting with affectionate love, your friend Franz Overbeck.
Cursed be he by day, and cursed be he by night. Cursed be he when he lies down, and cursed be he when he rises up. Cursed he be when he goes out, and cursed be he when he comes in. The anger and the wrath of the Lord will rage against this man and bring upon him all the curses which are written in this book, and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. Werden des Stadtrats geben bekannt, dass niemand mit Baruch de Espinosa sprechen darf, weder mündlich noch schriftlich, noch ihm einen Gefallen tun darf, noch mit ihm unter einem Dach sich aufhalten darf, noch sich mit ihm auf vier Ellen nähern darf, noch ein Papier lesen darf, das von ihm gemacht oder geschrieben ist. 370 vor Christus, Platon, der Staat, Verbot für die Dichter, drittes Buch, 40 F. Wir müssen diejenigen überwachen, die schnell über Tod und Schrecken erzählen, die Furcht erregen und vor der Unterwelt Schauder machen. Je dichterischer sie dies tun, desto weniger dürfen sie gehört werden, löschen wir alles dergleichen aus wie... Wie zur Vergeltung einer ungeklärten Schandtat, fährt uns in strampelnde, fressende Körper, die von ihrem Hunger und Durst, ihrem Hass, ihrer Angst oder der nackten Blödheit getrieben, am Ende doch auf irgendeinem Schlachtfeld des Lebens verstümmelt werden. Alles Klagen und Jammern werden wir also abschaffen. Politea, drittes Buch, 40G. Ebenso alle Lachlust, drittes Buch, 40G. Denn auch übermäßige Lachlust ist schädlich. Allzu leicht kann sie sich in ihr Gegenteil verkehren. Wir dürfen daher alle Darstellungen von Menschen, die von Gelächter oder von Klagen überwältigt werden, in unserem Staate nicht durchgehen lassen. Oder Erzählungen über Unbeherrschtheit wie Drittes Buch, 40i Dass der Olympia Zeus aus Verlangen nach Liebeslust beim Anblick der Hera der Gestalt außer sich gesetzt wird, dass er nicht einmal ins Gemach gehen will, sondern gleich dort auf der Erde sich zu ihr zu gesellen begehrt. In unserem Staat ist untersagt, sowohl toll zu sein, als tolles darzustellen. All dies werden wir zu sagen verbieten, vielleicht auch noch mehr als dies. 399 before Christ. The jury of one of the courts of the Athenian democracy condemned Socrates to death. The sworn accusation is about this. Socrates behaves sinfully by corrupting the young people and by not accepting the gods accepted by the state while instead accepting something different, new, harmonic. After the verdict, Socrates was handed over to those eleven men whose task was to supervise the execution of the death verdict. In a prison, he was offered the beaker with the already prepared drink. He took it without hesitation. Earlier, Socrates had received information about the course the poisoning would take. Most of all, hemlock causes spinal cord and brain paralysis. The poisoned person suffocates, while the consciousness is the last thing to die. Oh, you've got nothing to do. The man in charge of the poison told him, except after having drunk, walking around until your legs become heavy and to then lie down. When Socrates noticed that his shanks were becoming heavy, he lay down, straight on his back. Then the executor touched him time after time, and examined his feet and shanks, and asked him if he was feeling, to which Socrates said no. And then his knees, and this way he went ever more upwards and showed those around how Socrates became cold and stiff. 
When they uncovered him, he was dead. Dear Frederick, let me continue the array I abruptly finished my last letter. As you can imagine, it comes as no surprise that the first denunciation at work in the triple denunciation of consciousness, values and sad passions, the denunciation of consciousness comes along with a new model of the body. And even more general, with a re-evaluation of the significance of the material conditions one needs to perform one's actions in space and time. Deleuze assumes that you and Spinoza have declared a new materialism by using the body as the fundamental model for a new, almost artistic image of self. According to him, Deleuze, the false, the unsound image of thinking often promoted by rational philosophers lies in the wrong assumption that the rational plateau of our existence functions entirely separately from our desiring machines. Kant's concept of the nature of the aesthetic as desireless intuition perfectly attests this ascetic image of thinking. He tries to think as all classical philosophers did, at least since Socrates, separately from his designing machines. Everybody since then is called to dominate one's instinctual activities by virtue of subordinating them to the faculty of reason in order to produce a hierarchy or an assemblage of instincts and forces governed and ruled by the faculty of reason. I was laughing loud when reading your sentence about Kant in On the Genealogy of Morals that Kant's, I quote you, Friedrich, categorical imperative smells of cruelty. The Lutz would say it smells sadomasochistic, a hidden pleasure in producing pain by hurting others and ourselves. Spinoza de Deleuze calls him the prince of philosophy, as you all know, challenges the so-called irrational image of the body by simply throwing the seemingly innocent question against his opponents, do you know what the body can? In Spinoza's ethic, this question almost functions like a mantra cast against his opponents as a poisonous weapon, questioning the very foundation of their mode of thinking, as if the body would just be a mechanic passive instrument, ready at hand to be used by a disembodied spiritual subject as a tool needed to perform somebody's actions. Of course, Spinoza throws this sentence these rhetorical questions against the philosopher of his times, René Descartes, to bring him back to the raison d'être, that is to say, to the sense of our earthly bodily lives. You, Friedrich, you said it in yourself in On the Genealogy of Morals. We are so used to stand amazed before consciousness, but the truly enigmatic thing is rather the body because the body is no instrument but a toy, you said in such spoke Zarathustra, a playful, productive factory of dynamic forces, in Latin terms, a fabrica, ready to produce something different in comparison to somebody's inherited nature. In line with such an image of thought, one has to accept that our first person position is always already a second or third one a way of responding to a pre-subjective life that acts in us and upon us rather than we would act upon it, at least in the first place. I is another set rainbow. We do not know what the body can because it does not say I, but does I, as you, Friedrich, expressed this fact in Sassburg Saratustra. 
Because neither could I be here and speak to you, nor could I hear, sense and reflect what I am saying, if we would not be here corporeally, whenever I want to speak on bodies, I can do this only by actively operating my body, make use of my voice, my brain, my arms, my legs, and so on. Ben, on voulait dire la chose la plus simple du monde. On voulait dire, jusqu'à maintenant, vous parlez abstraitement du désir parce que vous extrayez un objet supposé être l'objet de votre désir. Alors, vous pouvez dire, je désire une femme, je désire partir, euh, faire tel voyage, je désire ceci, cela. Et nous, on disait une chose très vraiment simple, simple, simple. Vous ne désirez jamais quelqu'un ou quelque chose. Vous désirez toujours un ensemble. C'est pas compliqué. Et notre question, c'était, quelle est la nature des rapports entre des éléments pour qu'il y ait désir, pour qu'il devienne désirable. The second denunciation, at work in the triple denunciation, is the denunciation of the values of good and evil, replacing them by the values of good and bad. While the terms good and evil relate to a free will and its responsibility, good and bad are terms referring to the assemblage of desires actively at work in a body. But, and this is the crucial, Point, which links the second denunciation of values with the first one, a body is no thing, and not at all a thing in itself, but a local value of a relational field, a form of being with and being with others. Bodies are relational beings due to their very nature of fleeing from themselves to contact others and relate with them on a bodily, physical level already. Good and bad are just modes of sense in the relation of one body toward another. Modes of affecting and being affected by others. A value produced in relation to others and not by a single subject. A body is therefore a field of encounters, an end and und, as we say in German, and etc., and excess generated by virtue of the way one body relates with other bodies. What unites you, Friedrich Spinoza, and Spinoza says Deleuze, is the portrait of the resentful man, of bodies ruled by the spirit of revenge for whom all happiness is an offense, and who makes wretchedness or impotence their own passion. Such people do feel joy in establishing fearful relations and thereby compose the nihilism machine that feels pleasure in making everybody suffer, feel guilty in order to finally draw our lives towards transcendent supernatural values, the resentful man is an essential part of the tyrannical machine driven by hatred of life in general. He, she eats the energy of others in a vampiristic manner, separating everybody from the creative life affirming capacities of the life. On the contrary, gay science is the name of an ethics concerned with the question of how can we build milieus in which, let's say, bodies are having stimulating encounters with others. And is this not the very sense of a symposium on Deleuze and artistic research, of art space philosophy in general, that we are creating spaces of creative encounters, 
stimulating our bodies to become ecstatic, which literally means open themselves toward the external world, the field a body is physically sharing with others. Untimely encounters from now on good means becoming untimely. Ah oui, parce que c'est les textes, alors. Les plus extraordinairement chargés d'affect. Alors, euh, chargés d'affect à Jésus, donc ça. Et moi, ça revient à dire, il me semble, je simplifie beaucoup, mais ça revient à dire, la joie, c'est tout ce qui consiste à remplir une puissance. Vous éprouvez de la joie lorsque vous remplissez, lorsque vous effectuez une nouvelle puissance. The third denunciation, at work in the triple denunciation of consciousness, values and sad passions, is the denunciation of sad passions. From the perspective of his time, Spinoza was interpreted as dark precursors, and it, indeed he was one for the moralist trinity, namely the trinity of the slave mentality, the tyrants, and the ascetic priest. Spinoza's Deleuzean's Nietzscheans are regularly criticized for attempting to achieve an affirmative relation toward life. But this is a misunderstanding, a characteristic, a highly symbolic misunderstanding, typical for our times. Affirmation in the sense in which the three thinkers understood this term is, as you know, resistance itself. Why? Because Spinoza said it already, I just have to quote him again. Because a tyrant needs sad spirits in order to succeed. Just as sad spirits need a tyrant in order to be content and to multiply. Excommunication, war, tyranny, reaction, Men who fight for the slavery as if it were their freedom, this formed the world in which Spinoza lived. Not far from the global village or global slum of our times. The list almost becomes passionately heroic when saying that Spinoza, Spinoza had enough confidence in life, in the power of life, to challenge death, the murderous appetite of man, the rules of good and evil, of the just and the unjust. Because for him, it is joy which heals us from hatred and let us affirm this earthly life together. This is also the very reason why Nietzsche's Amor Fati is a practice of political resistance. It resists the very conditions of the tyrannical machine Therefore, only an ethics of joy, says Deleuze, is worthwhile, because only joy remains bringing us close to action and to the bliss of action. In this very sense, I send you again my affectionate love, Franz Buber.
Prozess. Ende. So kamen sie rasch aus der Stadt hinaus. Ein kleiner Steinbruch, verlassen und öde, lag in der Nähe eines noch ganz städtischen Hauses. Hier machten die Herren Halt. Jetzt ließen sie Karl los, der stumm wartete, nahmen die Zylinderhüte ab und mischten sich, während sie sich im Steinbruch umsahen, den Schweiß von der Stirn. Überall lag der Mondschein mit seiner Natürlichkeit und Ruhe, die keinem anderen Licht gegeben ist. Nach Austausch einiger Höflichkeiten ging der eine zu K. und zog ihm den Rock, die Weste und schließlich das Hemd aus. K. fröstelte unwillkürlich, worauf ihm der Herr einen beruhigenden Schlag auf den Rücken gab, während der andere Herr den Steinbruch nach irgendeiner passenden Stelle absuchte. Als er sie gefunden hatte, winkte er und der andere Herr geleitete K. hin. Es war nahe der Bruchwand, es lag dort ein losgebrochener Stein. Die Herren setzten K. auf die Erde nieder, legten ihn an den Stein und betteten seinen Kopf oben auf. Dann öffnete der eine Herr seinen Gehrock und nahm aus einer Scheide ein langes, dünnes Fleischermesser, hielt es hoch und prüfte die Schärfe im Licht. K. wusste jetzt genau, dass es seine Pflicht gewesen wäre, das Messer selbst zu fassen und sich einzubohren. Aber er tat es nicht. Vollständig konnte er alle Arbeit den Behörden nicht abnehmen. Seine Blicke fielen auf das letzte Stockwerk des an den Steinbruch angrenzenden Hauses. Wie ein Licht aufzuckt, so fuhren die Fensterflügel eines Fensters dort auseinander. Ein Mensch, schwach und dünn, in der Ferne und Höhe, beugte sich weit vor und streckte die Arme noch weiter aus. Wer war es? Ein Freund? Einer, der teilnahm? Einer, der helfen wollte? War noch Hilfe? Gab es einen, den jemand vergessen hatte? Wo war der Richter, den er nie gesehen hatte? Wo war das hohe Gericht, bis zu dem er nie gekommen war? Er hob die Hände und spreizte alle Finger. Aber an Kars Gurgel legten sich die Hände des einen Herrn, während der andere das Messer ihm tief ins Herz schließt und zweimal dort drehte. Mit brechenden Augen sah noch Kar, wie die Herren nahe vor seinem Gesicht, Wange an Wange aneinander gelegt, die Entscheidung überwachten.
Something unstilled, unstillable is within me that wants to become a love. The desire for love is within me that itself talks in the language of love. Night it is. Now like a spring my desire flows from me. I am desirous of speech. Night it is. Now all springing fountains talk more loudly. And my soul too is the springing fountain. Night it is. Now all songs of lovers at last awaken. And my soul too is a song of lovers. O oh man, take care. What does deep midnight now declare? I sleep, I sleep. From deepest dream I rise for air. The world is deep, <laughs> and deeper than they had been aware. Is its woe joy deeper still than misery? Woe has begun, yet all joy wants eternity, wants deepest, deep eternity. Gaius Valerius Catullus, Carmen V. To Lesbia. Let us live, my Lesbia, let us love, and all the words of the old and so moral, may they be worth less than nothing to us. Give me a thousand kisses, a hundred more, another thousand. Another hundred. And when we've counted up the many thousands, confuse them. So as not to know them all. So that no enemy may cast an evil eye by knowing that there were so many kisses 